Welcome to the Enchanted Library, where we turn the pages of books, beautiful and old, living and magical. It's time to curl up, get cozy, and join us on an adventure. Today we're reading from Otto of the Silver Hand by Howard Pyle. In the House of the Dragon Scorner A tall, narrow, gloomy room. No furniture but a rude bench. A bare stone floor. Cold stone walls and a gloomy ceiling of arched stone overhead. A long, narrow slit of a window high above in the wall, through the iron bars of which Otto could see a small patch of blue sky, and now and then a darting swallow for an instant seen, the next instant gone. Such was the little baron's prison in Trutstrachen. Fastened to a bolt and hanging against the wall hung a pair of heavy chains with gaping fetters at the ends. They were thick with rust, and the red stain of the rust streaked the wall below where they hung like a smear of blood. Little Otto shuddered as he looked at them. Can those be meant for me? he thought. Nothing was to be seen but that one patch of blue sky far up in the wall— no sound from without was to be heard in that gloomy cell of stone, for the window pierced the outer wall, and earth and its noises lay far below. Suddenly a door crashed without, and the footsteps of men were heard coming along the corridor. They stopped in front of Otto's cell. He heard the jingle of keys, and then a loud rattle of one thrust into the lock of the heavy oaken door. The rusty bolt was shot back with a screech. The door opened, and there stood Baron Henry, no longer in his armor, but clad in a long black robe that reached nearly to his feet. A broad leather belt was girded about his waist, and from it dangled a short, heavy hunting sword. Another man was with the baron, a heavy-faced fellow, clad in a leather jerkin, over which was drawn a short coat of linked mail. The two stood for a moment, looking into the room, and Otto, his pale face glimmering in the gloom, sat upon the edge of the heavy wooden bench or bed, looking back at them out of his great blue eyes. Then the two entered and closed the door behind them. "'Dost thou know why thou art here?' said the baron in his deep, harsh voice. "'Nay,' said Otto, "'I know not.' "'So,' said the baron, "'then I will tell thee. Three years ago the good Baron Frederick, my uncle, keeled in the dust and besought mercy at thy father's hands.' The mercy he received was the coward blow that slew him. Thou knowest the story? Aye, said Otto tremblingly. I know it. Then dost thou not know why I am here? asked the baron. Nay, dear Lord Baron, I know not, said poor little Otto, and began to weep. The baron stood for a moment or two, looking gloomily upon him, as the little boy sat there with the tears running down his white face. I will tell thee, said he at last. I swore an oath that the red cock should crow on Drachenhausen, and I have given it to the flames. I swore an oath that no vulif that ever left my hands should ever be able to strike such a blow as thy father gave to Baron Frederick, and now I will fulfill that too. Catch the boy, Casper, and hold him. As the man in the mail shirt stepped toward little Otto, the boy leaped up from where he sat and caught the baron about the knees. "'Oh, dear Lord Baron,' he cried, "'do not harm me. I am only a little child. I have never done harm to thee. Do not harm thee.' "'Take him away,' said the Baron harshly. The fellow stooped, and loosening Otto's hold, in spite of his struggles and cries, carried him to the bench, against which he held him, whilst the Baron stood above him. Baron Henry and the other came forth from the cell, carefully closing the wooden door behind them. At the end of the corridor the Baron turned— let the leech be sent to the boy, said he, and then he turned and walked away. Otto lay upon the hard couch in his cell, covered with a shaggy bear skin. His face was paler and thinner than ever, and dark rings encircled his blue eyes. He was looking toward the door, for there was a noise of someone fumbling with the lock without. Since that dreadful day when Baron Henry had come to his cell, only two souls had visited Otto. One was the fellow who had come with the baron that time. His name, Otto found, was Casper. He brought the boy his rude meals of bread and meat and water. The other visitor was the leech, or doctor, a thin, weazened little man with a kindly wrinkled face and a gossiping tongue. 
who, besides binding wounds, bleeding and leeching, and administering his simple remedies to those who were taken sick in the castle, acted as the baron's barber. The baron had left the key in the lock of the door, so these two might enter when they chose. But Otto knew it was neither the one nor the other whom he now heard at the door, working uncertainly with the key, striving to turn it in the rusty, cumbersome lock. At last the bulls grated back. There was a pause, and then the door opened a little way, and Otto thought he could see someone peeping in from without. By and by the door opened further. There was another pause, and then a slender, elfish-looking little girl, with straight black hair and shining black eyes, crept noiselessly into the room. She stood close by the door with her finger in her mouth, staring at the boy where he lay upon his couch, and Otto, upon his part, lay, full of wonder, gazing back upon the little elfin creature. She, seeing that he made no sign or motion, stepped a little nearer, and then, after a moment's pause, a little nearer still, until at last she stood within a few feet of where he lay. "'Art thou the Baron Otto?' said she. "'Yes,' answered Otto. "'Prut!' she said, "'and it is so. Why, I thought that thou wert a great tall fellow at least, and here thou art, a little boy, no older than Carl Max the gooseherd. Then, after a little pause, "'My name is Pauline, and my father is the Baron. I heard him tell my mother all about thee, and so I wanted to come here and see thee myself. Art thou sick?' Yes, said Otto, I am sick. And did my father hurt thee? Ay, said Otto, and his eyes filled with tears, until one sparkling drop trickled slowly down his white face. Little Pauline stood looking seriously at him for a while. I am sorry for thee, Otto, said she at last. And then, at her childish pity, he began crying in earnest. This was only the first visit of many from the little maid, for after that she often came to Otto's prison, who began to look for her coming from day to day as the one bright spot in the darkness and gloom. Sitting upon the edge of his bed and gazing into his face with wide-open eyes, she would listen to him by the hour, as he told her of his simple life in that faraway monastery home, of poor simple Brother John's wonderful visions, of the good abbot's books with their beautiful pictures, and of all the monkish tales and stories of knights and dragons and heroes and emperors of ancient Rome, which Brother Emmanuel had taught him to read in the crabbed monkish Latin in which they were written. One day the little maid sat for a long while silent after he had ended speaking. At last she drew a deep breath. And are all these things that thou tellest me about the priests in their castle really true? said she. Yes, said Otto, all are true. And do they never go out to fight other priests? No, said Otto, they know nothing of fighting. So, said she, and then fell silent in the thought of the wonder of it all, and that there should be men in the world who knew nothing of violence and bloodshed, for in all the eight years of her life she had scarcely been outside of the walls of Castle Trutstrachen. At another time it was of Otto's mother that they were speaking. And didst thou never see her, Otto? said the little girl. I said Otto, I see her sometimes in my dreams, and her face always shines so bright that I know she is an angel, for Brother John has often seen the dear angels, and he tells me that their faces always shine in that way. I saw her the night thy father hurt me so, for I could not sleep, and my head felt as though it would break asunder. And then she came and leaned over me and kissed my forehead, and after that I fell asleep. But where did she come from, Otto? said the little girl. From paradise, I think, said Otto, with that patient seriousness that he had caught from the monks, and that sat so quaintly upon him. So, said little Pauline. Then, after a pause, that is why thy mother kissed thee when thy head ached, because she is an angel. When I was sick, my mother made Gretchen carry me to a far part of the house, because I cried and so troubled her. Did thy mother ever strike thee, Otto? Nay, said Otto. Mine hath often struck me, said Pauline. One day, little Pauline came bustling into Otto's cell, her head full of the news which she carried. My father says that thy father is out in the woods somewhere yonder, back of the castle. For Fritz the swineherd told my father that last night he had seen a fire in the woods, and that he had crept up to it without anyone knowing. There he had seen the Baron Conrad and six of his men, and that they were eating one of the swine which they had killed and roasted. Maybe, said she, seating herself upon the edge of Otto's couch, 
Maybe my father will kill thy father, and they will bring him here and let him lie upon a black bed with bright candles burning around him, as they did my uncle Frederick when he was killed. God forbid, said Otto, and then lay for a while with his hands clasped. Dost thou love me, Pauline? said he, after a while. Yes, said Pauline, for thou art a good child, though my father says that thy wits are cracked. Mayhap they are, said Otto simply, for I have often been told so before. But wouldst thou not see me die, Pauline? Wouldst thou? Nay, said Pauline, I would not see thee die, for then thou couldst tell me no more stories, for they told me that Uncle Frederick could not speak because he was dead. Then listen, Pauline, said Otto, if I go not away from here, I shall surely die. Every day I grow more sick, and the leech cannot cure me. Here he broke down, and turning his face upon the couch, began crying, while little Pauline sat looking seriously at him. "'Why dost thou cry, Otto?' said she, after a while. "'Because,' said he, "'I am so sick, and I want my father to come and take me away from here.' "'But why dost thou want to go away?' said Pauline. "'If thy father takes thee away, thou canst not tell me any more stories.' Well, "'Yes, I can,' said Otto, "'for when I grow to be a man, I will come again and marry thee, "'and when thou art my wife, I can tell thee all the stories that I know. "'Dear Pauline, canst thou not tell my father where I am, "'that he may come here and take me away before I die?' "'Mayhap I could do so,' said Pauline after a little while, "'for sometimes I go with Caspar Max to see his mother, "'who nursed me when I was a baby. "'She is the wife of Fritz, the swineherd, "'and she will make him tell thy father.' for she will do whatever I ask of her, and Fritz will do whatever she bids him do. And for my sake, wilt thou tell him, Pauline? said Otto. But see, Otto, said the little girl, if I tell him, wilt thou promise to come indeed and marry me when thou art grown a man? Yes, said Otto, very seriously. I will promise. Then I will tell thy father where thou art, she said. But wilt thou do it without the Baron Henry knowing? Will thou not, Pauline? Yes, said she, for if my father and my mother knew that I did such a thing, they would strike me, mayhap send me to my bed alone in the dark. How One-Eyed Hans Came to Trutstrachen Fritz, the swineherd, sat eating his late supper of porridge out of a great, coarse wooden bowl. Wife Catherine sat at the other end of the table, and the half-naked little children played upon the earthen floor— a shaggy dog lay curled up in front of the fire, and a grunting pig scratched against the leg of a rude table close beside where the woman sat. "'Yes, yes,' said Catherine, speaking of the matter of which they had already been talking. "'It is all very true that the Drachenhausen are a bad lot, and I, for one, am no mind to say no to that. All the same, it is a sad thing that a simple-witted little child like the young baron should be so treated as the boy has been.' And now that our Lord Baron has served him, so that he, at least, will never be able to do us harm, I for one say he should not be left there to die alone in that black cell. Fritz, the swineherd, gave a grunt at this without raising his eyes from the bowl. Yes, good, said Catherine. I know what thou meanest, Fritz, and that it is none of my business to be thrusting my finger into the Baron's dish. But to hear the way that dear little child spoke when she was here this morn— it would have moved a heart of stone to hear her tell of all his pretty talk. That will try to let the red beard know that that poor boy, his son, is sick to death in the black cell. Wilt thou not, Fritz? The swineherd dropped his wooden spoon into the bowl with a clatter. Potsandin, he cried, art thou gone out of thy head to let thy wits run upon such things as this, of which thou talkest to me? If it should come to our Lord Baron's ears, he would cut the tongue from out thy head, and my head from off my shoulders for it. Dost thou think I'm going to meddle in such a matter as this? Listen, these proud Baron folk, with their masterful ways, drive our sort hither and thither. They beat us, they drive us, they kill us as they choose. Our lives are not so much to them as one of my black swine. Why should I trouble my head if they choose to lop and trim one another?' The fewer there are of them, the better for us, say I. We poor folk have a hard enough life of it without thrusting our heads into the noose to help them out of their troubles. What thinkest thou would happen to us if the Baron Henry should hear of our betraying his affairs to the Redbeard? Nay, said Catherine, thou hast naught to do in the matter but to tell the Redbeard in what part of the castle the little Baron lies. And what good would that do, said Fritz the swineherd? 
I know not, said the Catherine, but I have promised the little one that thou wouldst find the Baron Conrad and tell him that much. Thou hast promised a mare's egg, said her husband angrily. How shall I find the Baron Conrad to bear a message to him, when our Baron has been looking for him in vain for two days past? Thou hast found him once, and thou mayest find him again, said Catherine, for it is not likely that he will keep far away from here whilst his boy is in such sore need of help. I will have nothing to do with it, said Fritz, and he got up from the wooden block whereupon he was sitting and stumped out of the house. But then Catherine had heard him talk in that way before, and knew, in spite of his saying no, that sooner or later he would do as she wished. Two days later, a very stout little one-eyed man, clad in a leather jerkin and wearing a la round leather cap upon his head, came toiling up the path to the postern door of Trutstrachen, his back bowed under the burden of a great peddler's pack. It was our old friend, the one-eyed Hans, even though his brother would have hardly known him in his present guise, for, besides having turned peddler, he had grown of a sudden surprising fat. Rap, tap, tap! He knocked at the door with a knotted end of the crooked thorn staff upon which he leaned. He waited for a while, and then knocked again. Rat tat tat. Presently, with a click, a little square wicket that pierced the door was opened, and a woman's face peered out through the iron bars. The one-eyed Hans whipped off his leathern cap. "'Good day, pretty one,' said he. "'And hast thou any need of glass, beads, ribbons, combs, or trinkets?' Here I am, come all the way from Gruenstadt, with a pack full of such gay things as thou never laid eyes on before. Here be rings, and bracelets, and necklaces, that might be of pure silver and set with diamonds and rubies, for anything that thy dear one could tell if he saw thee decked in them. And all are so cheap that thou hast only to say, I want them, and they are thine. The frightened face at the window looked from right to left, and from left to right. Hush, said the girl and laid her finger upon her lips. There, thou hadst best get away from here, poor soul, as fast as thy legs can carry thee. For if the Lord Baron should find thee here talking secretly at the postern door, he would loose the wolfhounds upon thee. Put, said the one-eyed Hans with a grin, the Baron is too big a fly to see such a little gnat as I. But wolfhounds are no wolfhounds. I can never go hence without showing thee the pretty things that I have brought from town, even though my stay be at the danger of my own hide. He flung the pack from off his shoulders as he spoke, and fell to unstrapping it, while the round face of the lass, her eyes big with curiosity, peered down at him through the grated iron bars. Hans held up a necklace of blue and white beads that glistened like jewels in the sun, and from them hung a gorgeous filigree cross. "'Didst thou ever see a sweeter thing than this?' said he. "'And look, here is a comb that even the silversmith would swear was pure silver all the way through.' "'Then, in a soft, wheedling voice, "'Canst thou not let me in, my little bird? "'Sure there are other lasses beside thyself "'who would like to trade with a poor peddler "'who has travelled all the way from Gruenstadt "'just to praise the pretty ones of Trutstrachen.' "'Nay,' said the lass in a frightened voice, "'I cannot let thee in. "'I know not what the baron would do to me.' even now, if he knew I was here talking to a stranger at the postern. And she made as if she would clap to the little window in his face, but the one-eyed Hans thrust his staff between the bars, and so kept the shutter open. Nay, nay, he said eagerly, do not go away from me too soon. Look, dear one, seest thou this necklace? Ay, said she, looking hungrily at it. Then listen, if thou wilt but let me into the castle, so that I might strike a trade, I will give it to thee for thine own, without thy paying a barley corn for it. The girl looked and hesitated, and then looked again. The temptation was too great. There was a noise of softly drawn bolts and bars. The door was hesitatingly opened a little way, and in a twinkling the one-eyed Hans had slipped inside the castle, pack and all. The necklace, said the girl in a frightened whisper. Hans thrust it into her hand. "'It's thine,' said he, "'and now will thou not help me to a trade?' "'I will tell my sister that thou art here,' said she, and away she ran from the little stone hallway, carefully bolting and locking the further door behind her. The door that the girl had locked was the only one that connected the postern hall with the castle. The one-eyed Hans stood looking after her. "'Thou fool,' he muttered to himself, "'to lock the door behind thee.' 
What shall I do next, I should like to know? Here I am, just as badly off as I was when I stood outside the walls. Thou hussy, if thou hadst but let me into the castle for only two little minutes, I would have found somewhere to have hidden myself while thy back was turned. But what shall I do now? He rested his pack upon the floor and stood looking about him. Built into the stone wall opposite to him was a high, narrow fireplace without carving of any sort. As Hans's one eye wandered around the bare stone space, his glance fell at last upon it, and there it rested. For a while he stood looking intently at it. Presently he began rubbing his hand over his bristling chin in a thoughtful, meditative manner. Finally he drew a deep breath, and giving himself a shake as though to arouse himself from his thoughts, and after lifting a moment or two to make sure that no one was nigh, he walked softly to the fireplace, and stooping, peered up the chimney. Above him yawned a black, cavernous depth, inky with the soot of years. Hans straightened himself, and tilting his leathern cap to one side, began scratching his bullet head. At last he drew a long breath. "'Yes, good,' he muttered to himself. "'He who jumps into the river must even swim the best he can. "'It is a vile, dirty place to thrust oneself, "'but I am in for it now and must make the best of a lame horse.' "'He settled the cap more firmly upon his head, "'spat upon his hands, and once more stooping in the fireplace, "'gave a leap, and up the chimney he went "'with a rattle of loose mortar and a black trickle of soot. "'By and by footsteps sounded outside the door.' There was a pause, a hurried whispering of women's voices, the twitter of a nervous laugh, and then the door was pushed softly open, and the girl to whom the one-eyed Hans had given the necklace of blue and white beads with the filigree cross hanging from it peeped uncertainly into the room. Behind her broad, heavy face were three others, equally homely and stolid, and for a while all four stood there, looking blankly into the room and around it. Nothing was there but the peddler's knapsack lying in the middle of the floor. The man was gone. The light of expectancy slowly faded out of the girl's face, and in its place succeeded first bewilderment and then dull alarm. But dear heaven, she said, where then has the peddler man gone? A moment or two of silence followed her speech. Perhaps, said one of the others, in a voice hushed with awe, perhaps it was the evil one himself to whom thou didst open the door. Again there was a hushed and breathless pause. It was the lass who had let Hans in at the postern who next spoke. Yes, said she, in a voice trembling with fright at what she had done. Yes, it must have been the evil one, for now I remember he had but one eye. The four girls crossed themselves, and their eyes grew big and round with fright. Suddenly a shower of mortar came rattling down the chimney. Ah! cried the four, as with one voice. Bang! The door was clapped to, and away they scurried like a flock of frightened rabbits. When Jacob the watchman came that way an hour later, upon his evening round of the castle, he found a peddler's knapsack lying in the middle of the floor. He turned it over with his pike staff, and saw it was full of beads and trinkets and ribbons. How came this here? said he. And then, without waiting for the answer which he did not expect, he flung it over his shoulder and marched away with it. Thank you for joining us today. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave a review on your favorite podcast platform and share our podcast with a friend. Visit our website at www.enchantedlibrary.net to see our past books or to connect with us on Facebook. If you'd like to support the work we do, you can visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash enchantedlibrary. We appreciate your support. Until next time, friends, happy reading.